are in, I believe, our seventh year. I'm looking for any league member to nod at me with big eyes that I'm... Judy just gave me a thumbs up. We are in our seventh year of partnership. Yes, applause. And we are so proud here at Cantini Park to be able to do that. The reason being is the reason Cantini is here is a gentleman named Colonel Robert R. McCormick, who was the president and editor of the Chicago Daily Tribune and founder of WGN Radio and WGN Television. And when Robert passed away, he left Cantini to the public to come engage, be educated, enjoy their time, and enjoy their time together. And the Civic Awareness Series is a great way for us to take some of Robert, Robert's beliefs, his ethics, um, and share them with the community today to stay civically engaged and informed and to have civil discourse together. Those were really important things to him. And so we are very happy to be able to continue that legacy through the Civic Awareness Series. Before I formally turn things over, I just have two quick announcements to make. The first thing is for our online viewers at home. I know we have a lot of you out there today. Thank you so much for joining us on this cold, wintry March um, from home. Um, for you, just so you know, you can see it on your screen. The lecture has obviously already begun. This presentation is being recorded, but that is not a problem for anyone at home or really anyone sitting here, you guys aren't on camera and you guys at home have your cameras turned off and your microphones turned off. The only people who are being recorded are myself, a couple of my league friends, and of course, tonight's speaker. If you have any questions at all tonight, please don't hesitate to ask those in the Q&A. We will be attending to those at the end of tonight's presentation. For our in-person audience, the league is handing out cards for you to write down your questions on. Judy's holding them up here proud. That way we can have a little bit more of an easy flow to our Q&A. And we're gonna try and get through as many of our questions as we can, although I can already tell that people are very excited about tonight's topic. Um, if there's any technical difficulties for you guys at home, also use that Q&A. Myself and uh, my AV technician here, Andrew, we will be able to help with any of that, but if we need to know something, that's the best way to reach out and let us know. And we do see it, and we are trying as best we can to fix that. You'll also see that your closed captions are turned on. You can turn those on or off as you wish using your Zoom toolbar. If you need them, they're there. And actually, that's one thing we've learned is every now and then, sound gets a little bit weird with Zoom. And if that is happening for you at home, the quickest fix for you, the easy Band-Aid on that, is to turn on your closed captions. The microphone will still be picking up the words that our speaker will be saying while we try and make her louder for you at home. So that's our quick, easy fix. My other announcement is that moving forward, this is really important for our in-person audience, the Civic Awareness Series will be ticketed. What does that mean? It is still free to join us at the Civic Awareness Series. We do not want to put a barrier to education. But in order to help us give you a stronger experience moving forward, we ask that you go online to cantini.org to the event page. So for next month, it will be for Plastic Pollutions and Community Solutions, the best name of a presentation I've ever heard in my life. Um, and you'll click on the in-person registration button. It is free to register, and then you will show your ticket to the parking booth on the way in, and that is how I can also guarantee you free parking um, instead of having to pay that nasty $5 parking fee. So uh, make sure you register for in-person, and of course, you're going to have to register for virtual next month as well. I also do want to thank any teachers that are joining us virtually or in-person for professional development. We are happy to supply you with that opportunity to develop as professionals. I saw someone give a little cheer here. Just make sure if you've joined us in person that you are using the sign-in and sign-out sheet that's at the front of the room at that check-in table. That's how we can guarantee you that PD and prove that you were here. If you're joining us from home, don't worry. Zoom is keeping track of you for me. Without further ado, I am going to hand things over to Pam Zimmerman so she can get us started this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Pam. Thanks, Chris. All right, to find my, my notes here. All right, well, welcome, everyone. It's snowing, but you're here, so that's wonderful. And I know we have a lot of people joining us at home. So it's my privilege as the Civic Education Chair of the Wheaton League of Women Voters to introduce our speaker this evening. Her name is Joyce McIntosh, over to my left. And Joyce is the Assistant Program Director for the Chicago-based Freedom to Read Foundation, an organization dedicated to First Amendment education, litigation, and advocacy. She's worked at the intersection of intellectual freedom, communication, and the First Amendment for three decades. With the 
Freedom to Read Foundation and the American Library Association. Her work has focused on education about the First Amendment and censorship and helping librarians navigate challenges to intellectual freedom. Once again, uh, reiterating, we invite attendees to submit questions for the Q&A following the presentation on these sheets of paper that Judy held up before. So if you have a question already, or if you think of one during the course of the presentation, we invite you to submit it, and we'll ask, as, and, or ask and answer as many as we can. Um, as Chris mentioned, our virtual guests should please submit their questions and comments in the chat. Once again, we'll ask as many as time permits. So without further ado, I present Joyce McIntosh. I'm, actually, I'm Mike, yeah, all right. Good evening, thank you for getting out. I wanna get that off of my photo, there we go. Um, <laughs> first, I really do wanna thank Chris and everyone at Cantini, I absolutely love it here. And I credit the museum here and the grounds. Um, it's such a great place to explore. I have two sons who not only know it's fun to climb on tanks, but understand where those tanks have been and can go to such a great interactive museum. And League of Women Voter members, this is the worst season or the best, but thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for all the forums. Thank you for all the opportunities. I appreciate the work you're doing. So, and thanks for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm going to start by just sort of explaining the Freedom to Read Foundation and the ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. We're a separate nonprofit. We focus on education, litigation, and advocacy. The word that separates us from the American Library Association is litigation. Um, we will sign on to briefs, help write briefs, work in conjunction with many organizations throughout the US. Um, to defend intellectual freedom in First Amendment cases. The ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom uh, focuses much more on support uh, for librarians, authors, artists, um, any number of people, lots of educators. Right now, the, so the number one place where you find challenges to content right now is our public schools and the second is our public libraries. And in the last year, my colleagues and I have worked one-on-one, uh, -on -one, whether that's through Zoom calls, phone calls, or email, to support many, many, I'll share some stats in a few minutes, people through these challenges. Um, sometimes we will provide letters of support, we do confidential reporting and advocacy, and public awareness around this topic. I'm going to share a couple of definitions just so we're all on the same page because intellectual freedom and censorship could be huge. Everyone may have a different idea of what that looks like. Um, intellectual freedom, the right of unrestricted access to information and ideas as protected by the First Amendment. Censorship, and I've highlighted a few words here. The effort to ban, prohibit, remove, label, or restrict materials. The reason I point out those words is because lots of times people say, oh, if you've removed a book, that's censorship. Censorship can also mean I'm going to put it in a special area so people have to go and get it. I'm going to move an entire collection and that creates a barrier, whether it's the stigma of having to go and get it from that special section, whether you are labeling something, um, or making it harder to access. That is creating a barrier in someone's right to access that information. I'm going to talk a little bit about what our libraries really are. We all know our library. In fact, in Whedon, it's gorgeous and wonderful. Uh, I worked at Elmhurst Public Library for many years, also gorgeous and wonderful. Our libraries are such great places with so much to offer for everyone from one to 100. Um, but I wanna talk about what they really are structurally. So the government has set aside 
public libraries as a limited public forum. We are the only limited public forum. That means we're a place to provide one purpose, access to information and ideas. And your First Amendment rights are protected, but it's limited. So that means you can't, League of Women Voters folks know that they can't let people campaign on site. You can't, um, you know, you could go out in the street and yell whatever you want, or you could secure a park or go on the sidewalk. Um, you cannot do that within a library. So part of the limited public forum means you can have reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And that's our policies. And the best thing for any public library is to have content neutral rules, that's our policies, applying to standards of behavior. And they must be equal across the board for all people. Um, so I'm going to note that uh, public school's a little different. Students don't lose their First Amendment rights when they walk in the door of the public school. They still have those rights. But the public school library isn't a limited public forum. There's different rules because you're dealing with a different set of people. Um, so librarians have to adhere to professional standards in the same way that our medical professionals adhere to a set of standards we do too. Some of these are pretty clear cut. We're going to set aside our personal conviction. When you, I used to buy politics and religion for Elmhurst Public Library for about a decade. Boy, that's fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there is something in every single public library to piss one of us off. I can guarantee I did not love every single book I bought. Um, but we must as professionals set aside our personal convictions to provide access to information. We must cover all current and historic topics with their full spectrum of knowledge. Um, and I want to point out, this was adopted in 1939. So these policies are not ones that we're trying out for fun in this last year or so when so many challenges have popped up. Our profession has been based on these. We have criteria for how we purchase what we purchase. And we adhere to these principles while we do that. And the same goes for educators. Um, the ALA Code of Ethics was also adopted in 1939. And several years ago, a new, the latest one was added. That's at the bottom. Working to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases to confront inequity and oppression, and to enhance diversity and inclusion. And yes, there are absolutely days when provide information, sharing every point of view on current and historic topics, is a tightrope between that and the newest code of ethics. But with any other profession, for example, a minister. A minister is going to care for every person in their community, and they are going to set aside some personal convictions to provide that care. We are going to walk that fine line between making sure we have access to information for every person representing every point of view, and we're also going to conduct the way we function as an organization with this acknowledgement as well. Um, I, I pull this up just because the Freedom to Read statement was created around 1953. And I won't do a poll right now because I know I have to talk quickly in order to get our questions in. But the Freedom to View statement came around in the 1980s. Any guesses of what happened in the 1980s? Videotapes, MTV, all of a sudden we had music videos. So in the 1980s, there was a freedom to view statement added. So what are our librarians and trustees responsible for? Um, so trustees create policies for the library. The librarians are actually doing the collection development. We've been trained. We read professional reviews. We purchase from 
particular publishing houses, and we make sure that they're appropriate for our community, and then that they're in the proper space in the library. You're not going to have a book geared for a five-year-old in you know, the parenting collection. You're not going to have a book geared for a teenager so the four-year-old can pick it up. Um, trustees must also adhere to those values and set aside their beliefs. Trustees and staff must follow the same policies, those same rules that were allotted within that government-designated limited public forum. If we open up our meeting rooms, then we open up our meeting room to everybody in our community, whether we agree with what they're doing there or not, as long as it's not illegal. Um, if we open up our display cases, then we open up our display cases to everyone in the community. Now, you may have a policy that's carefully written saying, you know, I'm not going to have, well, let's, I don't know what would be a good example, but basically there may be some discretion built in, but you better prove that you're letting everyone have their equal opportunity to that space. So uh, this is where we get to the challenges part. Um, a brief overview would be that over the last, uh, I'd say four to five years, challenges have changed dramatically. Historically, you would have one parent come in or one person and say, I don't want my child to read Harry Potter. We don't approve of witchcraft. You would talk about it with them. They would fill out a form if they really were disturbed by it. Um, that would be the process. Things are different now. You have uh, groups coming in, and they are giving you a list of 20, 30, 40 books, uh, sometimes 100 books. You may be in a community where the library doesn't own any of the books on the 100, but they'll still go after you because you have a policy that says you could buy it. So it's really changed. The structure of challenges has changed. And one thing I like to note is that, um, so challenges come from both the left and the right, right? This is a, a nonpartisan problem. Um, I wish it wasn't a problem at all on any front, but it is a nonpartisan problem, and challenges come from both ends. But what I want to note is that challenges are coming from extremes. It's an extreme perspective when you say, I don't want my child to read this, and I don't want anyone to read this. So that's where there's been such a dramatic shift in what challenges look like now. In 2019, uh, this, so what I'm giving you as far as statistics is people who reported a challenge or an incident to the American Library Association, uh, whether it's through a phone call, filling out a challenge reporting tool, et cetera. 2020, everything went down, and frankly, people were focused on masks, right? That was what we were focused on in 2020. 2021, it popped back up, 729 challenges. The reason the title number is different is because, again, it was no longer someone saying, I don't like this particular book. It was someone saying, I don't like these 20 books. And we'll, in a moment, we'll talk about where that's problematic. Um, in 2022, that number is nearly double. In a few weeks, we're going to be releasing our report, and the number of people that my colleagues and I have walked through with these experiences in the last year is literally nearly, if not double. Um, so I'm a parent. What if I don't like the materials that people are holding up either? What if I'm like looking at this book and I'm saying that's obscene, or that is pornographic? or this is harmful to minors. The thing I want to note is that those are all legal definitions. You can't just think that's harmful to minors and make it so. These are legal definitions. 
And for that reason, I want to show you what a typical, so inside every collection development policy, that's the policy that says this is what we buy, this is how we determine what we buy, and this is why we choose these particular items. Part of that has to be because we also have our First Amendment right to say we don't like something. Part of it has to be a reconsideration form. This form had better have, let me see, what was the little pointer? Anyways, it better have something that says, have you read, viewed, or listened to the entire work? And I'm going to explain why. I mean, we're seeing everyone show up with that one picture they don't like. And it's like, yeah, as a parent, I'm going, yes, I don't like that picture. But you must take an item in its entirety. And the way you determine if something is obscene is, and, and you don't do it yourself. Like, I'm not going to declare something uh, is obscene. At this point, it's going to a judge. And I'm glad to note that at this point, judges have supported the First Amendment, and they've supported these values. And the judge is going to say, does it meet the Miller test? And if you read through this, you'll see that two, and it must meet all three points to be declared obscene. You'll note that two out of the three say the work as a whole appears to prurient interest, or the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. That is key. You cannot just say, I don't like this picture. You may look at that picture, it may be obscene, but if you read it in the context, you're going to learn so much more. The other thing I like to note is that none of us are purchasing books that are pornographic, obscene, or harmful to minors for our public libraries or our schools because we would be in hot water. It's you, so, yeah, those are legal definitions, and you must meet the Miller test. So what about young adults? What about minors? In Ginsburg versus New York, they determined that harmful to minors basically must meet the same criteria as the Miller test, but adjusted for age. And when that's adjusted for age by a judge, they're going by the oldest age level in that group. So right now, if someone is saying, I am protesting the fact that my school district has a book about gay teens, and what I can tell someone is that, you know what, okay, a judge is going to look at 17-year-olds, that a librarian's going to put that in the proper collection within the school system, and again, your five-year-old is never going to be picking that book up. And the other thing I would add, it's um, people aren't pointing this out while they're protesting, but English teachers, school librarians, have always had a parental opt out. If you don't want your child to participate in sex ed or read those materials or have access to them, you can opt out. If your son or daughter is in advanced English and they're going to have some books that relate to these topics, you absolutely, as a parent, have the right to opt out. That librarian's never going to act as a parent, not in the public library and not in the public school. Um, I, oh, I've got to mention viewpoint discrimination because right now with challenges, this is where uh, we're also running into books re related to race and people of color, books that relate to human sexuality or sex ed, and books that have LGBTQ content. These are the categories. And sometimes <clears throat> someone will say, I don't want any books with LGBTQ content in the library. You need to remove them all. We're going to defund the library if you have these books it's not going to fly, and here's why. One, you have to have books for every single person in the community, and legally, a judge is going to say you cannot apply 
viewpoint discrimination that violates a person's First Amendment rights. So if you're saying, I don't want any books related to sex, I don't want any books related to race, I don't want any books with LGBTQ content, it's about as clear viewpoint discrimination as you can get. Um, how am I doing here? Oh, oh we're doing good. OK. Um, so what can I do? Well, what you can do, if this is an issue for you, you can explain to people, OK, I understand how teachers and librarians select the books they select. I can go and look at the collection development policy and be familiar with it. We're with the League of Women Voters. I can run for local office. Our school boards and library boards and village and city boards have become so critical. And it's important to be able to express ourselves, but it's also important to remind our trustees that they must fulfill their fiduciary duty. That doesn't just mean financially. It means they need to provide for every student and they need to protect their First Amendment rights. Um, the other thing is think about your public library. Think about your school library and everything we offer. And sometimes when someone is focusing in on one or two books and you think about the portion of the collection that that represents, you can choose not to look at that book. But you want to send your kids to story time. You want to check out the ukuleles. You want to have the League of Women Voter programs and the educational programs and the amazing resources. And another thing that a librarian will never do, and this is where I always talk with librarians and say, we provide access to information. It's not our job to defend content because I don't know if one of you wants something for research. I don't know if one of you has a medical problem and that's why you're interested in this. If you are living in Texas or Oklahoma right now, I cannot aid and abet an abortion. I can't tell you this is where you can get an illegal abortion. But I absolutely do have the right to give you information about what an abortion is medically. And you can have the right to look at information online about abortion. Um, you can, let me see, what else can you do? Visit Unite Against Book Bans. I want to talk about Unite Against Book Bans for just a couple minutes. Um, so if, uh, about a year and a half ago, the American Library Association um, was trying to grapple with this. And sometimes you can't always solve everything. For example, I can't tell a school librarian to go to the next school board meeting and stick their neck out and risk getting fired. I can't. You know, you don't always want the person who's being attacked to have to be the one to stand up for themselves. Unite Against Book Bans is a public-facing advocacy campaign. Um, what I love about ALA and Unite Against Book Bans is the wonderful nonpartisan statistics. Uh, if you visit this website, you'll find that the statistics are nonpartisan. The talking points are designed for community members. Um, we, there's a challenge toolkit on here, and it won't look exactly the same as a challenge toolkit for librarians. For librarians, we'll be looking at how we design our policies, how we, um, how we create a panel, how we address this influx of challenges, who needs to be on that panel, um, what do our meeting policies have to say? Uh, because the reason I note our meetings, lots of times people will say, oh yeah, there's rules about how the kids have to act in school. And there's rules about how we all have to behave in the library. Well, that patron behavior policy applies to our meetings too. <laughs> you can't show up at a meeting and disrupt it. You are breaking a policy, you should be removed. 
So the, the policies that librarians are going to focus in on are going to look different than what you may focus in on if you are a community member and you're saying, I want to do something about this. Um, I want some talking points. I want to know how to organize around this. And that's why we created Unite Against Book Bans. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop here and we can do some Q&A. I think we've got, uh, do we have 15 or 20 minutes for Q&A? We have 30 minutes for Q&A. Oh, okay. Um, should I have slowed down? <laughs> um, While they're getting the questions from around, um, Andrew's going to hand me a mic so at home. I'm loud, but I'm sure. I'm sure they can hear me from their homes just right now. <laughs> but just to make sure they can, uh, while those comment or question cards are going around for our audience, um, Joyce, I have a question from one of our online guests. Great, thank you. Now, I might be butchering their question, um, but they said the Illinois Secretary of State has introduced or called for a new res law responding to book bans. And then they put a question mark, so I don't know if they're asking about if this has happened or they're stating it and there's just an extra question mark, uh, but how would that work with the regulations you spoke on? One moment, I'm going, there we go, okay. I just figured well, with that in the background, unless you've cut us off and they're just looking at me. <laughs> no, um, you're good. Um, so yes, as I'm trying to remember, Genulius? Yes. Okay, <laughs> Alexi Genulius, um, yes. Uh, so Illinois is the first state where something like that has been proposed. Um, we're going to be looking at that. Like with any House bill, you're, it's going to go through some iterations. Is it great that they are looking at telling libraries you need to have policies, they must provide access for everyone, and they must be well designed? Yes. Uh, the concern is that right now they're looking at attaching funding to policies, and that is, that's potentially something that would make us nervous, because if you attach funding to policies, that could be used in a way that would promote censorship, too. Um, I think that this is going to be reviewed and looked at, and we'll see where it ends up. Um, same uh, guest ask, is asking, there are candidates running for library and school boards who want to ban books and limit curriculum, how do we learn about their agendas and make sure voters know about their plans as well? I think that one thing that you can do, attend the League of Women Voters forums. Absolutely, attend. And um, I'm going to be going to three next week. Um, yeah, um, you can attend forums. And when you attend a forum, uh, look at Unite Against Book Bans ahead of time look at the challenge toolkit and review some of the questions there and review some of the statements there because you can ask a candidate, um, would you advocate for books being removed if you didn't approve of them? What role do you feel parents have regarding all students at a school? I think you could ask some questions where you could glean where they were coming from. You could also point blank, ask, are you affiliated with whatever organization um, is promoting the candidates that are doing that? Pam, do you have a question? Yes, we have a few here. Uh, Joyce, can you please speak to how states such as Florida have been able to limit uh, books in schools if they successfully have? Um, so it's incredibly frustrating, but they are now basically legislating censorship. And what needs to happen, again, you can't have, you know, I always advise any educators, go to your union, if your union. Find out if your union attorney is supportive of you. Protect your job first. It's really community members that need to take these issues to court. After some of uh, DeSantis legislation was enacted, now the lawsuits are beginning to roll in. I'm glad to note that in most instances, judges are saying, no, 
This is a violation of the First Amendment. But it's taking a while to catch up. And it's taking a lot of money. It's taking a lot of time. And it's taking resources away from our schools and libraries to navigate this. Um, and it's not just Florida. Uh, it's happening across the country. Um, so on that note, I would say absolutely get to know your representatives. Vote, vote, vote. Find out where they stand. Participate in lobby days. Uh, the American Library Association has a group called Policy Corps. And that's where a certain number of librarians every year are um, training on how to address legislative issues. Great, thank you. Chris, is okay if I ask another one from the audience? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, can a public library, Joyce, limit what's in their catalog if they offer the items through interlibrary checkouts, for example? Absolutely. Um, if I were to walk you through the scenarios that I use when I'm training librarians on collection development, you know, there's always that graphic novel you get that e is either so worn um, or it's the only one left in the collection, or there's the books that everybody rips off, frankly, and you've replaced three in the last month. Um, or you may not be able to afford something, but you understand that you have to provide access to information. Illinois is wonderful. We have rails, the reaching across the Illinois library system. Anybody can interlibrary loan anywhere in the state of Illinois. If you are doing research and you need something that's only in like three academic institutions, you can interlibrary loan. So yes, that absolutely counts. And the question is, can you get it through a database? In some instances where a state has said, we're not having any of this content, the Brooklyn Public Library has offered library cards for anybody living in a state where they can't access certain materials. And you can get it through their databases. I mean, that's called getting creative. But we're called to do this. We're called to protect your First Amendment right to access information. And so creative ways it is. Very good. Um, an audience member asks, can you give us an example of a lawsuit that the Freedom to Read Foundation has signed on to support regarding challenges to remove books from mm -hmm. schools or public libraries? Um, this one, well, there's been a few. Um, this one was a few years back. But uh, in the state of Arizona, there was a uh, case where the state determined that the Mexican-American heritage curriculum needed to not exist, and they removed it. And the Freedom to Read Foundation signed on with a couple of other organizations, wrote up the brief, uh, testified, and in that one, the judge determined, um, and it went back and forth a bit. It, it went pretty high. The judge determined that that was a clear case of viewpoint discrimination. That, that one was pretty clear. And then this last summer, um, the book Gender Queer, most challenged book in the country, um, that book, uh, basically someone said, well, we're going to make it so you can't buy it in any bookstore in Virginia. I mean, they didn't want it in the state, not just the schools, not just the public libraries. Someone said, we don't want it in the state, not even for sale. And we signed on with some other organizations and went to court. That one, what I appreciated was the judge said, no, you can't do this. But she went on to explain the Miller test and the fact that you have to adhere to this. And that was a good example of the fact that this still stands, that our judges are still following the law. They're still respecting the Constitution. Um, and that was upheld. OK. Are you good, Chris, over there? You've got? OK. All right, we have. Um, one other question, can you give an update to the current challenges in states 
you know, specific things that you're seeing in terms of banning access to either school or library so, uh, resources, uh, specifically if you could speak to schools, because that's one of the, the issues I think that we're seeing in this area. Uh, you're, the, the questioner refers to something that happened in Wheaton back in the 90s where a whole um, series of books, the Impression series, uh, was in fact the, the source of a question about banning mm -hmm. books. Um, we're not only seeing attempts to ban entire collections. For example, right now in Louisiana, the Attorney General's really going after librarians and public and schools both. Um, and there are attempts to say you have to remove or move like the entire graphic novel collection. Um, so we're seeing large numbers, that's a concern. The other thing that is disconcerting is the amount of funding that is going into these highly organized, well-funded groups to get to flip boards. Um, that's what we're seeing in our areas right now at many school districts. Um, and also throughout the country, we're seeing hate groups become involved. So um, you'll see Proud Boys showing up at events, uh, open carry, or you'll see librarians being threatened. Um, so we're seeing more of that. In regards to our area, the key really is to vote to be aware of who those candidates are and to remind them at meetings in public, you know what, you may get on this board, hopefully not, but if you get on this board, it is your duty to not have this board turn into your personal belief system. And they need to be held accountable and that's where community members really need to do it because teachers and school library educators often can't. In fact, they may risk their job if they show up at a school district meeting. The other thing is to encourage librarians from different types of libraries. In other words, you know what? Get librarians from Whedon College. Get librarians from the public library. Get librarians from wherever you can to show up on behalf of school librarians to show up at school board meetings and to explain this is what we do and how we do it and you know it's it's critical to become more active did that answer the question i, I ran so. on a little bit of a no i i think so well let, let me ask the audience member who asked the question <laughs> did, did was that a sufficient reply can you give us Uh, across the country, across the how country, widespread. how widespread? Absolutely everywhere. Um, Cook County. I, I would not have anticipated it in Cook County, uh, but in Lagrange, where I live, the uh, uh, the high school district is experiencing this exact thing. Um, the Bay Area of California. It's not as rampant. I'm going to be talking with staff at the Los Angeles Public Library in a few weeks. Absolutely everywhere. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a, oh, I'm sorry, that was louder than I was expecting, goodness. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> I forget how loud I can be. Um, from our online guests, what does the ALA do to encourage freedom of speech on college campuses and constraints affecting both students' speech, and visits by outside speakers to give talks? Yep. Um, that is a great question. And this is where sometimes, so the Freedom to Read Foundation, because we're a separate nonprofit, because we're focused on the First Amendment, often we're able to say more than the American Library Association. Um, the American Library Association and FTRF are both nonpartisan. We are representing all librarians, and sometimes those First Amendment questions get pretty tricky. 
It's not all black and white. It's not as easy as, of course you want this speaker. It can, it can be challenging, but what we are doing is working with uh, people at universities, um, whether that's the library or the English department, um, to work through challenges of that sort. The other thing I will note, um, in addition to the American Library Association navigating challenges with people across the board, the National Council of Teachers of English has been excellent. Uh, they have an intellectual freedom department as well. Um, I can guarantee you they are as busy as we are. I, I don't mean to jump around on you, but jumping back to what we were talking about before I took us down this path, one of our guests was wondering if you could uh, potentially give some advice on how does one hold a board member accountable, like you were saying mm -hmm. is important to do. Yeah. Um, you show up at a meeting, respectfully, minding the patron behavior policies or the school <laughs> policies, and you take your three minutes to remind that individual that they were elected for every single student, that they must adhere to that school's collection development policy. In fact, if you go around the policy, because we're seeing a lot of that, that relates to the state question. In many states, we're seeing people just kind of go around the policy. Oh, the principal said they didn't want this. Or the superintendent quietly came in and removed all these. Or I got to work the next day and there was no sign of it in the catalog. You remind people that if you go around the policy, which has been voted on through a proper format by elected officials, you're breaking the law. And then you proceed to remind their union attorney. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I also really appreciate the note of respectfully holding them accountable, not aggressively doing it. Um, um, this guest says that their elementary school district had an FOIA request uh, asking for a list of every book, title, and author in the library um, for each school in that district. They are concerned that this will be used for a negative purpose, such as trying to ban titles. Um, and what would you recommend uh, they do? Uh, and they also say thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was very helpful oh. and informative. Well, thank you for attending. Um, so FOIAs have become a tool to censor materials. And it stands for Freedom of Information Act. It's absolutely your right legally to go ahead and pull a Freedom of Information Act. That's a great way to get information. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when it's done at a school district, often people don't realize the number of hours of work that's going into that. The resources and the tax dollars you pay that are getting you know, pulled away from great programming. Um, so if someone's, I encourage librarians and school librarians to report to the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom and let us know what's going on. I encourage them to uh, report using a personal email address. You absolutely want to do that because if you're using your personal email address, you won't get FOIA'd. Um, it's, odd because I never would have said that five years ago. There are so many things I talk about today that I didn't ever imagine needing to talk about. Um, there's not much you can do other than fulfill the FOIA, but if those books do get challenged, again, know your supportive students, your supportive parents, your supportive community members, rally them to get out to the meeting, rally them to write letters to the editor, have them approach the superintendent, do whatever you can. Pam, I, I have more questions, but did, do you have any from our in-person audience? I have one more here. Please. Um, this one uh, says, as books must be provided to people and uh, of all interest, should our tax dollars be spent to provide a book or books educating and appealing to pedophiles so that that inclusiveness can be met? 
I am guessing that that would actually fall under obscene and harmful to minors. I mean, there are books that do fall into obscene and harmful minors. I doubt that you're going to find those in your public and school libraries. Okay. Related, uh, or, or another question that was written on the back, with books being rewritten, are copyright laws being disregarded to allow for this practice? I think, you know, what have we seen recently, Dr. Seuss, you know, books are, some of the, the yeah. people and families are, are having books rewritten, yeah. I think. Um, first off, you, if, so your collection development policy is going to be stating that you're, re, you're purchasing reviewed books. Um, you're going to be going through a legitimate publishing house, and I don't think there's the legitimate publishing house that's going to be infringing on copyright. Um, so that is one thing I'd know. And then I want to say something related to the question uh, that you just asked. Um, some libraries are saying, okay, we're not going to include materials that are false. For example, um, is it Alex Jones, Sandy Hook Denier? Some people are saying we're not going to have Holocaust denial books or we're not going to have Alex Jones books. Um, and they are writing into their policy uh, that they're not going to have books that are known to be faults. Um, that gets really tricky, and we haven't seen those go to court. But once again, this is where it's important to have your policies nailed down, but also have ones that are First Amendment respectful. Um, one thing I didn't mention uh, in speaking is First Amendment audits. And I know we've had some of those in the west suburbs. That is when a person will go into a public building, usually police stations, sometimes the post office, um, but a public office because they have the right to videotape staff in a public setting or they have a right to videotape in a public setting. They do it, one, to get in your face, create a ruckus, and then post it online and monetize it, saying their First Amendment rights were violated. Now, with a First Amendment audit, one, you don't engage because you're not giving them what they want. Um, second of all, have all of your spaces labeled. They can't go into the kids' library. You can't film children without their parental permission. You can't go into a private space. But what I, you know, what one thing that has been a good solution is to write into your policy a filming policy. You can't disrupt library services. Or, you know what, we have a beautiful space here. And we have people who want to get married in the library. We will give you filming rights for specific occasions, or if you are only filming the building. Or, so there are times when it is appropriate to have a filming policy. And that is one way to adjust for some of what's taking place now. Thanks very much, Joyce. Uh, that's all the questions that I have from the audience. So, Chris, I think we have a few minutes left if you have a... Absolutely. One. I'm going to wring every last bit of knowledge I can out of you, Joyce, <laughs> with what time you've committed to us. So, sorry. You're dealing with Pam and I and not Barb. But um, one of our other online guests has asked, have publishers started to self-censor their catalogs so that they don't have to face chal a challenge from schools or library boards? I don't know the answer to that as far as whether publishers are or not. I can say that I feel like publisher reviews have always been a bit cautious because no publisher wants a book that's deemed obscene. That's not going to make you popular with librarians. They're not going to purchase a ton. Um, I, but I doubt publishers are censoring. I imagine they're continuing to do what they've done. Now, what is disconcerting? is with this legislation throughout the country, you bet that public and school librarians are doing some soft censorship. Because if you know that your principal or a group of parents are going to attack you for having something in your collection, you may consider not purchasing it. 
And that is so hard. Because, yes, yeah, some of these books, like I said, it's hard as a parent to say you accept this book being in the collection. But the important thing is that they make sure that they have something for everyone. You may decide, I don't want this book, but I better have these books for LGBTQ teens. Or I better have these books that deal with race and the lived experience. Um, so it is a concern, that sort of soft censorship that people will start, you know, sort of the chilling effect, right? If I think my state's about to pass this, I might not want to risk it. On the flip side of that, um, how do schools and public libraries select books, such as books, uh, gender queer books, for a collection uh, that could cause parents to protest um, or people in the public to protest, is there an um, influence, an undue influence that uh, the fear of protest has on libraries selecting things for their collections? Yeah. yeah like I mentioned, it does. It can have a chilling effect. Um, gender queer is an interesting one because of, you know what, some libraries might say this is created on an adult imprint. So we're going to have it at the public library in the adult collection, and we're going to make sure our public library has it. If a student wants to get it, they can get it there. Um, some books you're going to want to say, OK, is this one really for kids, or is it for parents? You're going to think through where is it located in the library, et cetera. Um, but there is that chilling effect. You are, go you are going to think about it now. This isn't something, when I was purchasing at Elmhurst Public Library and I had to purchase books through two elections, again, that was so much fun. <laughs> and I guarantee there were books that really were hard for people on either side to think about buying, but it didn't ever cross my mind that I wouldn't buy them. And the other thing that's part of the collection development policy is quite often a library will say, if we have three requests from patrons, we'll buy the book. If we have six, we'll buy two copies. If you look at a library, um, I don't know, does everyone remember Fifty Shades of Grey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will swear we had 50 copies of Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Did, did we really want to spend our budget on that? Probably no, but those hundreds of holds, right? And that happens too with challenged books. Sometimes it's going to drive up interest. It's going to flip the, flip the original purpose of the censor. Just out of curiosity, this doesn't really have a lot to do with book banning, but obviously Fifty Shades of Grey has died down in popularity over the years. What do you do with those 50 copies <laughs> at this point, now that you probably only need one? Do y'all have a book sale room? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they get, they get picked up pretty quickly. Um, you weed them. So that's part of the job, too. You weed the collection. You determine how many times is it checked out, how current is it, is it the best thing for right now, and then you select it. Usually it ends up in the community book sale room and someone is excited because they got to buy it for 50 cents. <laughs> so I'd like to, we're at 8 p.m. I want to be respectful okay. of not just your time, but the time of our audience who has braved this weather to come out here. And I would like to take us home uh, with one question from one of our teachers who's joining us virtually, um, since they are definitely here for, the, for their professional development and to learn. Um, as a teacher, what is, and this, I, I love ending um, any civic awareness series on advice for anyone. So this is great because I'm sure this advice would span to more than just teachers. But for a teacher, what is your advice to working with parents regarding book bans? Um, to always de-escalate, right? If you are angry and mad or someone comes at you and they're angry and mad, listen, invite them to sit down. Let them know you're glad they're interested in what their child is reading. Um, so start by de-escalating. If they can't, you know, just from a conversation, get to the point where they're calm with it, then you know who they should go to. You know who they should talk to to get 
a reconsideration form. And what's so key in a lot of a lot of both public and school librarians weren't ready for this. I, you know, um, maybe we should have seen it coming in some ways, but I don't think we were ready for quite the amount, right? Lots of schools and school librarians may not know their policy. They may not know the curriculum development policy or the library media center collection development policy. So make sure you know if you have one or not. If you don't have one, you create one. There's resources online through ALA, but you can also pick up the phone and we can work with you to have a good, productive, fair, sound policy. Um, and once you know those policies, there has to be an end to this. And that's another thing that we've changed. If you have a policy, say, the decision of the principal or the director or the board of trustees will be the final decision or any book will be removed for X number of years or it will be retained for X years or we will not revisit this title for X years. So make sure there's an end to the policy or the process, excuse me, make sure you know the policy, and if you don't have one, create it yesterday. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joyce. Thank we you. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Wonderful and information. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, wonderful information. Thanks to all of you for coming. Could I ask you for a round of applause for our Cantini hosts, too? Yes. So um, to, to wrap things up tonight, I'd like to introduce our president, Judy Beaver, who's got some upcoming announcements for you. Thanks, Pam. And thank you, Joyce McIntosh, for making us smarter about this topic. Thank you. Especially telling us about the Bill of, Library Bill of Rights, the resource organizations, the statistics, just everything. Um, we're grateful that you spent the evening with us. And also thank you to our audience, both here and virtually, thank you um, for joining us tonight. And a big thank you to our partners at Cantini once again, and to our sister leagues, um, Central King County, Glen Ellen, Naperville, and Roselle Bloomingdale. Please remember the local elections are April 4th. Our leagues are having candidate meet and greets and forums to educate voters. Some have already taken place, so the recordings would be on our website, so please make sure you visit our websites. Um, if you weren't able to attend. Otherwise, check our websites for schedules of upcoming free meet and greets and forums. So just please vote. <laughs> um, we hope to see you April 12th. It's a Wednesday, so please note that it's a Wednesday, not a Thursday next month. Um, and at Cantini or online, um, as, as Chris told you, um, it's Plastic Pollution Community Solutions. I too love that title. <laughs> um, and we'll have a plan panel of experts from Go Green Glen Ellen, SCARES, Solid Waste Agency of Lake County, and the Illinois Environmental Council. So just remember it's Wednesday next month, April 12th. So please join us and we look forward to seeing you next month. And just as Chris had mentioned, remember to register both online and virtually because you'll need to get a ticket in order to come in here and park free. So, so anyway, good night, drive safely if you're traveling, and thank you once again. We'll see you next month.